Welcome to the Open Gear How To video series. This episode is initial setup. Imagine, today is the very first day of a brand new job for you. Your new boss has asked you to set up an Open Gear appliance. You have no idea what it is, what it does, or even how to get started. No worries, I'm your coach. Today, we're gonna look at the initial setup of an Open Gear appliance. It's always a wise idea to start any new project by consulting the vendor documentation. At OpenGear, we keep our documentation on our website under support documentation. You can also find it from ftp.opengear.com. When looking for the manual, pay attention to the specific product in question or feature in question and click through to the specific manual that describes that capability. When looking at the manual, we do indicate in the top of the URL which firmware version that this manual is related to. And so if you're on a firmware version different than what is shown, you may see or expect different results. And so it's often wise to edit the URL to match the firmware version of the firmware you are running on the appliance you're setting up. Under ftp.opengear.com, we have access to a lot more resource data as well as specific useful files. Specifically, documentation is broken down by API manual and quick start. For each, the manual and quick start, we indicate what is the latest and greatest or what is legacy either appliance or legacy firmware. Uh, and the same thing goes for the quick start, what is current here and what is legacy. We also have support in ChatGPT. If you're a user of ChatGPT, you can explore GPTs and search for OpenGear or use either of these two URLs. I've given it access to our current documentation as well as the syntax and structure of OGCLI. Bear in mind that ChatGPT is not perfect and you are encouraged to verify any information it provides you. When connecting into the management ports of the appliance, you'll see we've got a console port, and some uplink net one, net two, sometimes net three, net four ports. In the case where there are two different ports sharing a common label like net one S and net one C, this denotes SFP versus copper, yet the configuration of these two ports is shared. So do not try to connect both net ones into your network and expect them to operate differently. If the appliance you're setting up is a 10G model, please check the user guide to be sure that the version you have will support 10G or 1G on the SFP because some only support 10 gigabit ethernet. Some of our appliances have software selectable pinouts for their serial ports, but not all. And the serial console port is not software selectable. And so it will be either an X2 or an X1 pinout. And the manual will tell you as well as an upcoming slide. When looking at cellular support, there are some important things to know. Some of our appliances, especially the legacy ones, required that the SIM card be inserted prior to powering on the unit. While this may not be the case with our latest generation appliances, it is still advised that you put the SIM in before connecting it to power and try not to remove it in a hot swappable fashion. When pushing the SIM into the slot, push it all the way until you hear it click, but know that this click is not the same as a lock. And so if the appliance could be bumped or jostled, we recommend you put some tape or a sticker over the SIM to prevent it from accidentally being slid out. When using the antenna extension cable outside of the rack, because a rack with walls is effectively a Faraday cage that will reflect or absorb the cellular signals, we do provide this extension cable, but please know you can see about a six decibel loss in signal strength when using this cable. Regarding the GPS, we do have the antenna for it, but it is not used by our firmware at this time. Also regarding the diversity antennas, the main will be used for transmit and receive, whereas auxiliary will only be used for receive. Regarding the configurations you can expect out of the box, Note that net one, and if there is one, a net three, are both configured as DHCP clients and they have a static IP. If this default static IP overlaps with the address space on your production network, we do not recommend you connect it until you've removed this IP or changed this IP. To do that, 
You can access the CLI of the appliance in a few ways. One, you could use the RS-232 RJ45 serial console port, or you can connect into an IP network without overlap and SSH to either the DHCP or static address, or even just use your browser to access that address. Note that the appliance does ship with a default username and password. You are required to change the password for the root account, and it is recommended that you later disable this account after creating a new administrator that's able to log in and access and administer the box. Note that the appliance does come with a default firewall policy, and you're encouraged to consult with your security team and edit the policy to allow traffic from your trusted LANs, WANs, VPNs, and do not block the Lighthouse Tunnel Network uh, if you're editing that firewall policy. I want to talk about serial port pinout for just a moment. When you see in OpenGear documentation a reference to X2 or X1, it can be a little confusing. And so I'll direct your attention to this knowledge base article where we dig deeper into the meanings of X2 versus X1. Know at a high level that it starts from a historical precedent set by Cisco, and X2 represents a straight cable, where X1 represents a rolled cable. The behavior of an open gear console port is denoted up here. Now, in this instructional video, when I mention X1, that is the setting your upstream device would need to support if it is another open gear connecting to the console port of a downstream open gear, or you would need a terminal adapter with an appropriate pinout to connect to an X1 or an X2. An X2 connector can go straight into an X1 connector and signals will pass. But if an X2 is connected to an X2 or an X1 to an X1, you will not see the signals line up and data will not pass. In order to access the appliance for the first time, if you want to connect to the CLI via the RS-232 serial port, please note the pinout and baud rate for the different models. If you're going to access the web UI of the appliance, please pay special attention to the fact that it does require HTTPS colon slash slash and then the address. Now you will be presented with a security warning, but don't worry, this security warning is simply saying that the issuer of the certificate used by this website is not trusted by your browser. That's because the appliance generates a self-signed certificate, but because you're the one deploying this appliance, you powered it on, you know its IP address, click advanced if you're using Chrome or a Chromium based browser down to uh, the link to proceed and then you can log in with the default credentials and continue your setup process. You would be wise to change the SSL certificate in the appliance to one signed by your corporate certificate authority as a way to remove this security warning. Next, you should add the appliance to the central manager of Lighthouse. It can be done in a couple different ways. Here you see in the center of the screen the different TCP or UDP ports required for communication. If you're going to add the appliance to Lighthouse directly from the perspective of the appliance, this makes sense because you're setting up the appliance for the first time as a new entity. You can log in, find the section for Lighthouse enrollment, tell it the IP or FQDN of your Lighthouse server, the port that you're going to use, this could be 443, as shown here, or 8443 if 443 is otherwise restricted. For instance, if you're hosting Lighthouse on the public internet and you don't want anyone to be able to browse to it directly, 8443 would be advised in that scenario. And please note that 8443 can only be used for appliance enrollment to Lighthouse. It cannot be used to access the web interface or API or anything else. You will also need to provide the name of your enrollment bundle, and you'll see me do this in my demo in just a moment. Alternatively, you can log into Lighthouse, and if Lighthouse has IP access to the appliance, you can add the appliance directly from there, just by supplying the address of the appliance and credentials to log into the appliance. There are more ports that you should be aware of with regard to Lighthouse communication and appliance communication. For instance, I haven't mentioned port 22 at all. And so for a more comprehensive list of the ports required, I will refer you to this knowledge base article. Now time for the demo where we put all this together. 
Here I'm using another Open Gear appliance to connect to the console port of a downstream Open Gear appliance. So I'm using a CM8148 to connect to a default OM2248. So I'm going to connect to port 2 here. There we go. We see our login. I'm going to type in the default credentials. It wants me to change the default password, so I have to reissue that password. And now I can supply my new password. Oh, and if you get them wrong, it'll let you know, so you start all over. There we go. So now it shows me my uh, default IP and the uh, DHCP setting. To see the rest of the configuration, I'm going to use an OGCLI command and export the config. To keep it simple, I'm going to pipe this out to less. Okay, there's a lot of config here, and to get to the section for my default IP, I'm going to use the search filter or function within less to search for the default IP of 192.168.0.1. There, it found it. I'm just going to up arrow a little bit and then copy all of this config stanza, and I'm going to pop it into Notepad here. Now, it's not admittedly the easiest to interpret OGCLI, and so I'm going to get uh, help from the CLI, just OGCLI help and con, because these are connections, or cons. So let's see what it can tell me. I'm going to queue out, and I'm going to do OGCLI help con, like this. And it gives us some examples of how we can update our default IP. So I don't need this stuff for net two, but I do want this stuff for net one. So I'm gonna copy this section, and remember I need to end with end. And I'm gonna put it in here into my notepad, and I'm gonna get my end back here, put that at the bottom. And at this point, I just wanna update these addresses uh, to match. But also notice this name here, con66 isn't what I want, because this is default con1. So I'm going to copy that up. The rest of this looks fine. And then I'm going to change the addresses to something relevant to my subnet. And the mask is fine. I'm going to copy this back, paste it into my console here. I'm going to hit enter. Awesome, no error messages is a good thing. So let's just confirm that it took the address by doing an IP uh, space A. We can see there it does have that IP, and let's confirm it also in the config. Pipe this to less again, and then I'll search for the pattern. And I don't even have to do the full thing. And there it found my IP, mask, gateway, and broadcast. So this looks great. I'm going to queue out of here now, and let's see if I can browse to the web interface at 188.8. So I've got the address already plugged in here. I'm going to refresh. All right, and I'm going to click through to get to the web interface. And here we are. I'm going to log in with the credentials I set. Awesome. We are now accessing the OM2248. The next thing we want to do is get it enrolled in the central manager of Lighthouse. To do this, I come under Configure Lighthouse Enrollment, hit the plus, and it just wants four pieces of information, which I will be able to grab from my Lighthouse server. We log into that. Okay. And then under Node Tools and Enrollment Bundles, I've got a bundle here uh, that I'm going to go ahead and just pull up, copy my bundle name, oh, uh, right there, and then copy my bundle token. The port is going to be 443. And in the interest of security, I'm going to skip ahead in the video and keep my Lighthouse address secret. Click Apply. It says it has enrolled. So then I'll come over here to Lighthouse, and under Dashboard, you can see I have a pending node that is enrolling currently, and it's the 2248. Once this is ready, I'll have this little check mark available for use. Okay, 
It is registered, just waiting for approval. All I have to do is click this checkbox and it is now approved and it will show up as connected in just a moment. That's it for this initial setup video. Upcoming videos will focus on configuration of the serial ports, configuration of IP console devices, our smart management fabric, and so important, security basics. Thank you.